day one. I still remember the night before. I'd gone out to celebrate a friend's birthday. We had no idea it would be the last normal night of life on Earth. At just past 6 in the morning, I was woken up by a massive roaring sound and a bright flash of light. It felt like a giant body slammed me as I got picked up and thrown out of my bed. Good thing, too, because the ceiling came crashing down where my bed used to be. The entire side of my three-story apartment building ripped away and a hurricane-force wind as hot as an oven washed over me, giving me first and second degree burns, and I was one of the lucky ones. Anybody caught out in the street was instantly vaporized or torn to shreds by the pressure wave. I found out later that it was a quirk in our local geography that saved my life because the buildings 300 feet north of me and toward the detonation point just happened to be on a slight hill about 45 feet higher than my apartment building, causing the hill to absorb most of the pressure wave, sparing me and a few other survivors. When my hearing came back, I thought about trying to save people but remembered that immediately after a nuclear explosion, you have about 10 to 15 minutes to find shelter from the fallout. So I immediately grabbed what few supplies I could get my hands on and ran for the underground parking garage of our apartment building. On the way, I yelled at a few survivors to join me, but only four of them did. The rest were too dazed or confused to pay attention, or were too busy trying to dig out buried friends and family from the rubble. Sadly, it would soon be too late for them as well as a massive cloud of radioactive fallout crashed over the city after being swept miles up into the air by the initial blast. There was nothing we could do as the five of us huddled in a storage closet on the second basement level of our apartment building. I don't even know when night came, I just remember finally falling asleep from pure emotional exhaustion. Days 2 through 7 In my first week surviving nuclear war, there wasn't much to do except make our shelter better. Luckily, the people I was with had been as fast thinking as me, so we had barely enough water between us to survive a week if we rationed it. Food was something else. Even rationing it, the food would only last about four days. That's okay. Water's more important than food. Every 24 hours that you can remain away from radioactive fallout, the danger level drops exponentially, so we knew we had to stay in our shelter for at least a week to get to survivable levels of fallout. The power had gone out immediately after the bomb's impact from the massive EMP blast that it caused. It had burned out all of our electronics, including phones, so even if we had reception, it would have been impossible to get news from the outside world. Inside our shelter were me, my two neighbors, Lilith and Alexis, and the elderly couple who lived down the hall from us, Mr. and Mrs. Vasquez. We tried to piece together what had happened to us, and Mr. Vasquez was sure that shortly after the first blast, he heard a second one in the distance. That confirmed it for me. Whatever happened to LA wasn't an accident or a nuclear terrorist attack. The fact that there were multiple impacts means this was an attack by a modern ICBM carrying multiple warheads. This left only Russia or China, which left us with a bigger question. Was the world at nuclear war, or was this just a single attack? With no working radio or telephone, it was impossible to tell. We huddled in that basement until the end of seven days, lit only by an old flashlight that Mrs. Vasquez had brought with that had incredibly survived the EMP blast. Days 8 through 12. I knew it was dangerous to leave our shelter even after seven days. Ideally, you want to remain in place for 10 to 14 days until radioactive particles have lost most of their energy, but we were out of water and Mrs. Vasquez was looking really bad. Me, Alexis, and Lilith had all given up our last two days of water rations for her, despite her initial refusal, but eventually she accepted. At this point, the danger comes from inhaling radioactive particles, or having them land on exposed skin, and getting into cuts, scrapes, or even wounds. Once inside, they bathe your body with radioactivity, and despite being very low yield, it's still dangerous enough to kill you if you breathe in a lot of particles. We used the very last of our water to soak up several rags and put them around our mouths and noses and did our best to cover up any exposed skin. When we finally dug our way out of the parking garage and into the city, we were shocked by what we saw. The famous LA skyline was gone. Only a few skeletal remains of our big downtown buildings remained. Our neighborhood had been completely devastated by the impact. It was an absolute miracle we survived. But that also meant that we were in the most dangerous fallout area, being so close to the point of detonation. We had to move, and we had to move fast. What affected us the most was the bodies. There wasn't much left of the people who'd been caught in the open when the bomb exploded, and what was left now was the remains of the people who had choked to death on radioactive dust or burned from within after inhaling vast quantities of it. These people had survived the impact but hadn't taken proper shelter. They were probably forced out into the streets in a desperate attempt to find help or food or water. Instead, they found more radioactive dust. It was a sober reminder that we needed to take decontamination of our clothes and bodies very seriously once we found a better long-term shelter. We decided to head out of downtown LA and head toward the San Fernando Valley. It was unlikely that the valley would have taken a direct hit, 
since there wasn't really much of commercial or military value there. Plus, the Bob Hope Airport is a federal emergency response site, meaning this is where the government would send rescue and supplies in an emergency. It's likely whoever attacked us might have known this and targeted the valley anyway, but it was the best course of action available to us. However, we needed water and food, as we were all feeling faint, so we picked our way through the debris and traveled just over a mile before we found a corner store which had been blasted open. Luckily for us, there was still plenty of sealed water and other drinks, as well as food on the stock shelves. The plastic would be enough to keep things from being contaminated, but to be safe, we only took items from the very rear of the shelves, stuff that would have had the least amount of radioactive dust sitting on it after a few days. I insisted we hunker down, now that we had food and water, and wait for the weak mark so that nearly all of the most dangerous radioactive fallout would fade to acceptable levels. We found a garage just outside the blast zone and packed it with food and water, then closed the door behind us, and we waited. Days 13 and 14. We had plundered some extra clothes from the ruins so that we could change out of the radioactive dust-covered clothing, and we were careful to seal up all the outside openings with duct tape so that the dust wouldn't blow in. We even wasted precious water to carefully wash ourselves free of the dangerous dust. That required the buddy system, and I have to admit, I was glad that Alexis chose me as her buddy. She lived next door to me for a few months now, and I'd always had a crush on her. I guess there's worse people I could have gotten stranded in a post-apocalyptic world with. But was it really the apocalypse, or was it just a local event? Maybe the US and Russia or China just exchanged a tit-for-tat attack, and then the powers that be thought better of plunging the entire world into nuclear hell. There was just no way of knowing. Before we entered our shelter, we had scanned the skies looking for any sign of air traffic, but never saw or heard a single plane or helicopter. That bothered me. But the military and government could very well be busy dealing with catastrophes elsewhere. It didn't necessarily mean the world had come to an end. Mrs. Vasquez had been hiding her hurt foot, but eventually the pain was too much for her and she came clean, showing it to us. She must have injured it sometime during the attack and when we ventured out of our shelter, radioactive dust had gotten into the wound. It looked brackish and brown, and the brown was spreading. Plus, she'd started coughing and looking pale. None of us wanted to say it, but we all knew she was dying. The radioactive debris had entered her bloodstream and spread around her body. Radioactivity was burning her alive from the inside out. Days 15 to 20. Mrs. Vasquez died on day 15, just as we decided it was finally safe enough to walk around outside. The group would have to get used to people dying, if the worst had really happened, but it hit us really hard. We'd become a small family in the last two weeks, and as far as we knew it, we were the only survivors in a city of millions. We were literally all we had. We couldn't bury Mrs. Vasquez because that would mean stirring up the radioactive dirt, so instead we sealed her inside the garage and marked the door with spray paint, promising to come back and give her a proper burial when we could. The group took extra precautions against dust and debris. Just because most of the radioactivity had died down by now, it didn't mean travel was safe. But we had to keep moving. Our supplies would only last a few more days, so we had to find another safe location to raid for food and water. Plus, all of us were eager to make it to the valley and find out if the rest of the world had survived or not. We kept traveling east, away from downtown, eventually making it to the 101 freeway. It was hard going through since it was choked with all kinds of cars and debris. Sometimes we had to climb over stacks of cars, like they were small mountains, though most of the time we were forced to detour to find a way around, because there was no way Mr. Vasquez was getting over them even with the help of ropes. Days 21 through 22. Alexis and I had been talking a lot at night, away from Lilith and Mr. Vasquez. We were all doing everything we could for Mr. Vasquez, but he was getting slower by the day, and there was nothing wrong with him physically. I think he was just too heartbroken and overwhelmed to go on. I couldn't imagine living through a nuclear attack and then losing the woman I'd loved for over 50 years. I guess maybe I too would want to give up. Alexis asked me if I'd ever leave anyone behind, even if they were slowing the group down. I told her absolutely not. She smiled and grabbed my hand for a second, giving it a firm squeeze. I couldn't help but smile back. But despite our constant encouragement, Mr. Vasquez was slowing down. He insisted once or twice that we go on ahead. He'd catch up with us, but we refused. On day 22, just before setting up camp inside a destroyed city bus, I heard something shuffling around outside. When I went to investigate, I was shocked to find a dog. It was a poodle something mix. You could tell he was really hungry from how skinny he was. I was amazed we hadn't found anybody or anything else that had survived yet in the last three weeks. Just tons of corpses, of people who had died trying to flee the city only to run into the fallout. He was nervous. Obviously, he'd been alone for the last three weeks. But his instincts to seek out people eventually won, and he came over when I called him. The group gathered together to meet him, and incredibly he was still wearing a collar with a tag that read Lucky. Well, 
He was definitely lucky to have survived the explosion and the fallout, so the name suited him perfectly. Having him join us really lifted all our spirits, and we needed it badly. Even Mr. Vasquez smiled for the first time since his wife died. The next day we set out again with renewed vigor. Days 23 through 26. Traveling from downtown to the San Fernando Valley on a normal day can take up to an hour thanks to traffic. It was taking us over two weeks because of all the wrecks, debris, and need to stop and constantly replenish our supplies. Mr. Vasquez wasn't helping matters either. He had briefly perked up after Lucky joined our group, but he soon was lagging behind again. I didn't blame him. His heart was broken. I couldn't imagine the pain of losing someone you've spent half a century with. But when I did try, I caught myself looking over in Alexis's direction. Sometimes I caught her looking back my way too. On day 26, we met another two survivors, a brother and a sister duo, who had the same idea as us. They'd survived inside a house just outside downtown, and Annie, the sister, had been smart enough to make Ben, her brother, shelter in place with her until after the fallout settled. Annie told us she was sure there were other survivors still huddled up in houses around the city, but there were so many corpses in the streets that we were sure most people had died from fallout poisoning. We were glad to have more company, especially Lilith, who had been feeling a little lonely since me and Alexis were hanging out so much. Day 27 Mr. Vasquez didn't wake up on the morning of the 27th day. There was nothing physically wrong with him, he'd just given up. It was still far too dangerous to dig, so we laid him to rest best we could and said a few words, promising to try to get word to any surviving relatives. Days 28 through 32 we were moving slightly faster now, but the freeway had suffered serious enough damage in parts that we were forced to leave it and head to the side streets, which slowed us down again. However, that's where we found something truly chilling, a body. But this wasn't like the other bodies we'd been finding since we left our shelter. This was different. It was fresh, maybe just a few days old, and the cause of death was obvious. Someone had shot this person and left them to die. The fact that the body had been stripped of anything valuable told us everything we needed to know. Everyone's worst fear had come to pass. There was at least one group of looters out here, preying on travelers. I suppose it was inevitable. I remember a quote from somewhere that went something like, civilization only lasts as long as the lights are on. We were now on the lookout for weapons to defend ourselves with, and we decided to take a detour to a local gun shop that Ben knew about in the area. Given the condition of the roads, it would take us a few days, but if it was still standing, it'd be more than worth it. Days 33 through 35. It took us just over three days to get to the gun shop, which took us way off course. When we arrived, though, it was clear we weren't the first to have this idea, which was kinda good news as it meant more people had survived multiple nuclear detonations over Los Angeles. It was also bad news, though, given the evidence we'd seen of someone killing and looting survivors. The front of the gun shop had collapsed in on itself, so we had to force our way in through the rear. Ben and I went first, and we were shocked to be greeted by the business end of a shotgun. A dirty, crazy-looking old man was in there, and he thought we were after him. Luckily, we managed to calm him down. Turns out we'd gotten to the shop shortly after he did and inadvertently startled him. I didn't want to, but Alexis insisted on offering that he join our group. I had a weird feeling about him. I mean, it's good he didn't blow our heads off, instead talk to us, but there was just something off about him. My guess is he already had been suffering from some kind of mental illness, and the nuclear attack pushed him right off the deep end. He had no problem with us helping ourselves to what was left, but he insisted on taking all the shotgun ammo he could carry, which didn't leave much for us. Then he crawled out the same way we crawled in and just left, waving away Alexis's offer for him to join us. She sighed a breath of relief when he declined. Then I got embarrassed. I could tell back in the real world she'd been a genuinely good person, and she probably felt guilty about being relieved that the crazy old man had ignored her offer. Lilith had some firearms experience since she'd grown up hunting with her dad in Ohio, and I had some due to a few years in the Army Reserves when I was younger. Between the both of us, we did our best to train Alexis, Ben, and Annie on how to use the handguns we gave them, and then taught them how to shoot in an alley a mile and a half away. We had plenty of ammo, so there was enough for target practice on the few handguns and two rifles we looted. We thought about setting up camp at the shop. It was definitely a secure place and we'd have ready access to more weapons and ammo, but then we thought twice about it. If we knew this place existed and the crazy old man knew the location of the former gun shop, it's likely other survivors would too, and I didn't like the idea of us attracting attention. Days 36 through 40. Alexis didn't like that I was trying to avoid other people, but I just wanted to keep our group safe. We decided that we'd sleep in as long as we could in daytime and then travel mostly in the latter half of the day and at night. It would help us avoid any unwanted attention. Alexis complained about this. I could tell she really wanted to help anyone that might still be out there. But just as we got back to the 101 freeway, we saw another fresh body. 
That put an end to Alexis's complaints about us purposely avoiding other survivors. I could tell Alexis was scared after finding the second body. She refused to leave my side when we finally set up camp late at night. I tried talking to her about the old world, reassuring her there was no way the entire world went to war with nuclear weapons. All we had to do was get out of LA and we'd find civilization again. That made her feel a little bit better and she held my hand again. It was weird feeling so happy in the middle of an apocalypse, but holding her hand and having her fall asleep next to me just felt right. Days 41 through 46. Annie and I had discussed the two bodies we'd found, and when we found two more bodies, this time laying side by side, where they'd been gunned down, we came up with a plan. She had hunting experience, so she took point and led the way a few hundred feet ahead of the group. That way, she could scout out any trouble before we actually ran into it. I didn't think that there were bandits out there setting up ambushes, there just weren't enough survivors around. We'd heard people in the far distance once or twice but never actually came across anyone, so it was probably an unfortunate coincidence that us and whoever was killing the other survivors were traveling in the same direction. We likely had the same idea, get to the valley where there was bound to be safety. Day 47 On day 47, we finally reached the part of the 101 that passed in front of Universal Studios. We were officially in the valley, but things did not look good. There was plenty of destruction all around us, with the Hollywood Hills between the valley and the explosions in downtown LA and elsewhere. Most of the buildings here should have been spared. The best thing to do was get a good view of the local area. So we decided to climb up to the top of Mulholland Drive where there were a few scenic overlooks that couples used to go park their cars at night and look at the lights of the valley below. Days 48 through 51. It took us three days to make the climb up the hill because the hills were an absolute mess. Before nuclear Armageddon hit Los Angeles, the hills had been full of houses that were perched perilously on the steep Hollywood Hills landscape. This was dangerous enough given how frequently SoCal got rocked by earthquakes, but the nuclear blast had caused seismic activity so intense, most of the houses had slid down the hills and crashed into the streets below. This meant that climbing the lower portions of Mulholland was like trying to traverse a deadly obstacle course. Once we got to the upper portion of Mulholland though, we had a different problem. Here, entire sections of the road had been washed away by landslides, so we often had to find a completely different way around. Eventually though, we managed to get to the backside of Mulholland Drive where you could overlook the entire valley on a clear day. What we found made our hearts sink to the bottom of our chests. I'd been right about the enemy, whoever it was, targeting Bob Hope Airport because it was a federal emergency response location. You couldn't quite see the airport from our vantage point, but you could see the decimated ring of destruction that represented ground zero of an atomic blast. There was a similar ring over in the direction of Van Nuys, where another airport had once existed. In between the two rings of total annihilation was miles and miles of lesser but still overwhelming destruction. We set up camp as night fell so we could collect our thoughts. There'd be no help coming, it seemed. So our next course of action was clear. We had to get out of the city, but where to go? As we considered our options, we all heard a strange noise, something like the sky slowly tearing in two. Looking around us, we spotted two blinking lights far off in the distance, traveling south. That's when it hit us. It had been so long since we heard any air traffic that we'd almost forgotten what a jet engine sounded like. It was impossible to tell what type of aircraft it was, but we knew where it was headed and that was San Diego. Our spirits soared that night. And even Lucky must have felt it because he started happily barking along to our cheering. Someone had survived. The world hadn't ended after all. The attack was probably just on Los Angeles, maybe one or two other major cities, and a conventional war was still probably going on. But that's why there hadn't been an emergency response yet. The military was too busy. The rest of the US must still be humming along. That night, Alexis and I kissed for the first time. I guess the euphoria of knowing civilization had survived got the better of us, but I could tell she didn't regret it. In fact, she pulled me straight in for another kiss. I only wish we'd been more reserved about our celebration. I had no way of knowing that somebody else had not just seen the same airplane overhead, but heard us cheering wildly in the distance. Days 51 through 56. We had a new plan. Head south out of Los Angeles and follow the 5 freeway all the way to San Diego. It was a bit concerning because there were some important military installations there, but the fact that we saw a plane headed in that direction really lifted our spirits. Besides, the sad truth is we didn't have many options. It seemed like most of LA County had been obliterated in a nuclear strike, and the terrain around Los Angeles is not very hospitable. We could have headed north and tried to reach some of the smaller communities, but we figured that our best bet was to go somewhere the government would be invested in securing, and that meant San Diego. The way down the Hollywood Hills took us twice as long as the way up because the route was so unsafe, but at least we were able to raid the abandoned houses for supplies. We even found some new camping gear in one home and replaced some of our worn out tents and sleeping bags. 
What was really holding us back was the fact that we had to carry everything we owned on our backs, so we were limited on what we could take and how fast we could move. Days 57 through 62. Getting to the 5 freeway was an ordeal in and of itself. We decided to head through Burbank to get to it and past Universal Studios and the Warner Brothers film lots. They were nothing but smoking debris now, since we were so close to the impact site near Bob Hope. But it was incredible to think that just over two months ago these places were full of movie stars and thousands of people all making hit movies that would be watched around the world. Our group had gotten close in the last few weeks and Lucky was our de facto mascot. He really helped keep our spirits up. And with a goal in mind and the hope of seeing civilization again, the mood was generally positive, which is weird when you're passing by dozens of human remains every day. I could tell that Annie and Lilith were getting close, and that made me feel better because I was worried Lilith would think I had stolen Alexis away from her. Day 63 On day 63, Annie warned me that she thought someone was following us. She'd taken to scouting around us as we traveled. Sometimes she'd be out ahead, sometimes to one of our flanks, other times far behind us, catching up a few hours later. It was when she'd been lingering behind that she caught sight of a small plume of smoke a few miles behind us as we set up camp for the night. She spotted it three nights in a row, so she didn't think it was a coincidence. Then again, the 5 freeway would be the obvious choice for anyone traveling to safety in San Diego, so I wasn't convinced it was a threat. Besides, we hadn't run into any more fresh victims from whoever was out there killing people. She reluctantly agreed, but I could tell she wasn't convinced. I wish I'd listened to her. Days 64 through 68. We were finally outside of LA County and here the destruction lightened up. We caught sight of two more planes and that sent an electric shock of excitement through the group. The US had survived after all. Travel was faster outside of the main blast zones, but it seems as if multiple warheads had leveled not just most of LA County, but the surrounding cities as well. That makes sense. SoCal is obviously one of the most economically important parts of the US, especially Los Angeles, so it's obvious an enemy would try to destroy as much of it as possible. We picked up some bicycles from a mostly intact sporting goods store and managed to use them to carry more supplies, which made life a lot easier. Lucky had a blast keeping up with the bikes, and we had to ride slowly most of the time anyway because of all the debris, but we were making good time. By my count, we can make San Diego in a week or two at most at this rate. Day 69 Somebody took Lilith shortly after we set up camp for the night. She excused herself to use the bathroom, and we heard a brief struggle in the distance and then nothing. We immediately set out, but we couldn't find her. Annie picked up a trail, though, of what she thought was at least three people with a fourth being dragged. Her old hunting skills really came into play as she immediately set out to track Lilith's kidnappers, but I had to stop her because my own military skills warned me against rushing straight into what could be an ambush. Annie and Alexis were both adamant that we set out right away, but I calmed them down by pointing out the fact that whoever took Lilith wanted her dead, they would have just attacked our camp. Finally, they agreed, so we waited until it got really dark, then followed the trail. I followed the group from the left flank though at a distance so I could remain on scene with my rifle. Turns out though that whoever took her had horses. How would they manage to survive through the attack and fallout I'll never know, but there were clear signs of where the horses had been tied up and then the tracks that led north into the wreckage of the city. Now I felt stupid because my insistence that we wait until it was fully dark had cost us an hour of pursuit time. Maybe we could have gotten to them before they got to their horses. At least we had tracks to follow. Day 70 and 71 it took us a day and a half of following the tracks to finally catch up with the kidnappers. They had holed themselves up in a surviving strip mall in the city of industry right outside LA. I guess they didn't expect us to follow for so long and so far because it didn't look like they were expecting visitors. Now we just had to hope that Lilith was alive. Annie and I were the best qualified for a rescue mission so we waited until nightfall again and snuck up to the edge of their little compound. You could tell they were starting to secure the area because there were makeshift barricades in the middle of being constructed. But there were no guards posted. Instead, we heard laughing and some screaming coming from one of the buildings. Then suddenly the screaming cut off into a choking gurgle. With growing pits in our stomachs, we snuck over to the building where all the sound was coming from. Peering in through a broken window, we spotted a group of five all huddled around a fire, with a sixth figure chopping something up. To our horror, we realized what he was chopping. A person. That must have been who had screamed before being butchered. With a sigh of relief though, we spotted Lilith chained up against a far wall. Whoever was being butchered, we guessed, about to be cooked, at least it wasn't her. Annie and I came up with a plan. We were both pretty good shots and angry as hell, so we waited until this crew of six settled into their disgusting meal and then split up. She attacked from one side while I attacked from the other, catching them between us. Annie opened fire first, shooting one of the cannibals in the chest, and then I started unloading. We dropped three instantly, with the third reaching for a pistol and taking a shot in my direction. Annie got him clean between the eyes as I ducked for cover. 
then finished off one of the two survivors who took off running. I immediately gave chase for the surviving runner. I didn't want any part of this evil troop to survive and prey on other innocents. Annie, meanwhile, went to rescue Lilith, in case there were more around somewhere. The survivor turned a corner a few dozen feet ahead of me, and then I heard two gunshots almost simultaneously, followed by a scream I recognized as Alexis. Turning the corner, I found the surviving runner laying on the ground, clutching his leg. Across from him lay Ben, dead, from a gunshot to the chest. Ben had come to try to help when he heard gunfire, and when the two ran into each other, the cannibal had been the better shot. With a roar of rage, I turned my gun on the survivor and pulled the trigger. Day 72 through 76. If there were other cannibals around, they didn't bother to give chase after the rescue. We didn't bury Ben either, because of fear of contaminated soil. But we covered him with rocks and a makeshift cairn like our ancestors used to. Annie was inconsolable, but having Lilith back helped. Our world had become cruel and deadly faster than any of us could imagine. Days 77 through 82. The road to San Diego was harder than we expected. The freeway had been packed when the bombs fell, so there were a lot of vehicles getting blown around by the superheated hurricane winds. We spotted another group of travelers in the distance heading north, and Alexis wanted to make contact with them. However, both Annie and I put our foot down and absolutely refused. We weren't taking any more risks. Days 83 through 89. The freeway was now running near the beach, and the sound of the ocean was almost comforting. Or it would have been if the beaches below us weren't covered in debris that had been washed out to sea and then right back on the waves. As far as the eye could see, the beaches were covered in the debris of an entire coastal city, destroyed in nuclear hellfire. Back in LA, the skies were perpetually covered in black sooty clouds. Out here, the ocean winds created gaps in the clouds, but most of the time, all we had over our heads was thick brownish clouds. We all knew that trillions upon trillions of pounds of debris had been blown up into the sky in the attacks, but could there really be so much that it covered the entire sky in dust and debris? As we neared San Diego, I was getting more and more nervous. Day 90. We spotted another airplane overhead, this time unmistakably a fighter jet. It came in from the ocean and seemed to head in the direction of San Diego before coming up north in our direction and curving back out to sea. Looking through a set of powerful binoculars we'd looted, Lilith swore that she could vaguely see the outline of an aircraft carrier out there in the horizon. We had to take her word for it, she had the sharpest vision of us all. She'd quickly taken to learning how to shoot the two rifles we'd brought with us and was proving to be a crack shot. Lilith was determined to never be helpless again. Days 91 through 96. Progress slowed down again due to debris and the fact that we got caught up in a severe storm. This is rare because SoCal almost never has bad storms in the summertime. We noticed that the temperature had been dropping slowly over the last three months as well despite it being the middle of July. We thought about setting out rain catches to help replenish our water supplies, but I thought better of it once I saw how greasy the rain was as it fell. My fears that the skies above were still polluted with debris from the bombs proved true. The rain had come down hard for two full days, and when it finally cleared there was no sunshine, just big puddles of sick smelling water left behind. Luckily, we could still find plenty of convenience stores left abandoned with shelves full of drinking water. Days 97 through 99. Something wasn't right. The lights from San Diego should have been visible at night for the last two days despite the heavy cloud cover. Alexis figured it could have been the EMP blast from the attacks on Los Angeles. I wanted to believe her, but I couldn't shake the gnawing feeling at the bottom of my stomach. Even Lucky felt it too. His normally happy self was looking increasingly worried, probably from picking up on the group's stress. Day 100. There was no denying it. San Diego had been hit by a nuclear attack alongside Los Angeles. That explained the lack of lights or traffic coming from the city. We finally traveled close enough to see it for ourselves. The skeletal remains of the iconic San Diego skyline far in the distance. The group was too crushed to do anything but set up camp early. If there was no safety in San Diego, then where could we go? Just how far had the war spread? That night, we got our answer. Far out at sea, somewhere in the direction that Lilith swore she'd seen the outline of an aircraft carrier, came a blinding white flash followed by a dull roar a minute after. I knew what I'd just seen, but it took me a while to pull myself together to explain it to the group. Whoever had attacked the United States with nuclear weapons had just struck again, this time destroying a carrier battle group just off the coast of Southern California. LA hadn't been the victim of a single attack, and nuclear war hadn't destroyed the entire world. Nuclear war was destroying the world, because it was still being waged. A half hour after the explosion at sea, three plumes of fire from somewhere deep inside the United States lit up the night sky briefly before disappearing into space. Nuclear intercontinental ballistic missiles from fields in the American heartland to strike back at whoever just hit us again. The war was clearly ongoing. While everyone had expected World War III to be over in an hour, we were dragging it out over weeks and even months, hitting tit for tat as one major city after another got wiped off the map. How far had it gone? 
Where would it stop? What was even left? Now go check out This Is How You Actually Survive a Nuclear Attack, or click this other video instead.